All right, hey guys, it's Scott Williams from EMS Education. I'm going to talk about part two, ventilator training, modes, and operation. In this section, we're going to talk about setting up the proper mode and settings for your particular patient. I want to divide your patients into two major classes just for simplicity's sake and to make it easier for you to decide on settings and to quickly and effectively ventilate your patient without much delay. I want to put them into two categories and these two categories are obstructed and lung injury patients. When we talk about obstructed patients, the ones we're talking about are the asthma, COPD, pulmonary fibrosis patients, the ones that bronchoconstriction is a problem, the problem with exhalation. So we're going to change our settings uh, with reference to our rate and our IE ratios. Primarily those are the two settings that we're going to change a little bit for the obstructed patients. Everybody else kind of fits into the lung injury category. Your cardiac arrest, uh, ROSC patients, unresponsive, overdoses, uh, pneumonias, ARDS, and the like. We're going to basically look at those two classes. So the first thing you get to decide is what type of patient are you dealing with. You want to choose a mode. Most commonly we're going to use the assist control volume mode. The only time I can see you probably using a pressure mode is if you're picking up a patient that's already in a pressure mode on the ventilator that is from the referring facility, and you may want to keep that going because it seems to be working for that patient. You can just go down to the mode on the bottom right portion of the screen. You'll see a P or a V. You can highlight that and change it to pressure mode and hit your OK button and set up the rest of your vent after you do that. Next thing you need to do is choose your settings. Now your tidal volume is going to be based off of ideal body weight, which is based off of their height. You may use a chart. You may calculate that. you got to decide on your rate, your peak pressure, your PEEP, your IE ratio, and then your FiO2. you got alarm limits. You can up the uh, upper alarm limits on your peak pressure if you need to. Uh, there may be other ones you got to change to keep it from alarming, but those are there to keep your patient from experiencing any high pressures or maybe low pressures, and let you know that something's not quite right. We'll talk about some changes that you can make there. Once we get those settings input into the vent and the patient's going along and ventilating, we want to monitor its effectiveness by looking at our CO2, looking at our pulse ox, and watching our vital signs, and keeping an eye on our heart rate and blood pressure. Blood pressure can drop with increased peeps, uh, and our end tidal can change with... Uh, you know, too high of a rate, too low of a rate, so we're going to watch, want to watch those things. I want to simplify some terms for you. Uh, when we talk about tidal volume, I want you to think of that as lung protection. Tidal volume doesn't really change that much just because of what's wrong with us. So if you set a tidal volume, it's probably not going to modify very much. You want to set a rate because that equals ventilation and an increased rate, decreased rate, however you set it. It's basically going to be modifying your entitled CO2. Now your IE ratio, this is a new setting for this ventilator compared to the ones we've had before. So this ratio is really important to set, especially when you're talking about obstructed patients because those patients need a little bit more time to exhale. So you're going to want to increase the IE ratio to 1.4 or 1.5 and give them plenty of time to do that, as well as lower that rate so that they have plenty of time to exhale before they get that next breath. Now when you think of FiO2 and PEEP, I want you to kind of think of these as they go together. If you've oxygenated a patient with 100% O2, whether you use PEEP or not, you're probably going to gate that patient down to about 40 to 60% FiO2 once they're oxygenated. Now, if you run into oxygenation problems due to ARDS, maybe a near drowning, some other type of uh, fluid infiltration into the pulmonary system, then you may want to increase your FiO2. As you do that, you're going to want to increase the PEEP very gradually, watching blood pressure very closely, and work those two together to increase oxygenation. We want to make sure that the alveoli stay open and that they're not collapsing every time the patient is exhaling. If they collapse, then we have atelectasis, and that is called derecruitment. And whenever they collapse, it makes it that much harder for the vent to in inflate them on the next breath, and that increases the work, and it also increases the pressure, and it's going to give us some peak alarms. So increasing a little bit of PEEP might keep those alveoli from collapsing, and it allows us to get a little bit better diffusion. Next, you want to determine the mode that you're, you're in. So we're choosing either obstructed or injured lungs. 
consider injured lung as baby lungs. We want to take good care of them. We don't want to overventilate. And we want to just make that setting to where we reach that capacity without exceeding it. Now, obstructed lungs, we want to give them time to exhale. That's our goal with COPD and asthma. If our non-invasive doesn't work and we're down to where we have to intubate these patients and we, we give them some medication, say some Brissette or Atomidate to get them intubated, we want to also continue to give our beta agonists so that they'll work and continue to get that patient out of trouble. But you've got to give them time to exhale. So it means we're going to keep some rates low, keep our IE ratios a little bit higher so that the patient gets better a little faster. Your obstructive strategy is going to be set the tidal volume at about 6 to 8 cc's per kg. This is a lower setting than probably has been talked about in the past. You may have heard of uh, tidal volumes at about 10 to 12 cc's per kg. Studies have shown that these higher tidal volumes don't actually help the patient and actually decrease mortality or increase mortality. So we don't want to overshoot these tidal volumes. Giving them about 6 to 8 cc's per kg watching our peak pressures is probably the safest thing that we can do for the patients so that we ventilate them effectively and not in a dangerous mode. I want to set the rate. Now when we're talking about obstructions we need to make sure we give them time to exhale. This is the most important setting for these patients. If you set this rate too high you can set the IE ratio still to 1.4 or 1.5 but they may not have time to exhale. You want to keep that rate probably about 10 maybe no more than 12 and set that IE ratio up to about 1.4 or 1.5 and give them plenty of time to exhale. We don't want to stack breaths because stacking breaths increases endothoracic pressure, drops our blood pressure, decreases oxygenation, and could potentially put our patient in cardiac arrest. We're going to titrate our FiO2. We'll start with 100%, but in about five minutes or so, we're probably going to drop that down to about 40 to 60% and see how our patient's doing. You may or may not need PEEP. I probably wouldn't start out with any PEEP on most of these patients unless they were having oxygenation problems. If they were, then I would probably start increasing it from probably about three centimeters of water to maybe five at the most and increase my FO2, my FiO2 to a point where I get better oxygenation. Now you want to watch closely as you get these settings going and you want to watch that end tidal CO2. Make sure it's not dropping too fast. If they're retaining, you can increase the rate, but do it gradually. Don't do it too drastically like changing a rate from like 10 to maybe 14 or 16 because increases in the ventilatory rate at that point are going to shorten the expiration time because of that rate and are potentially going to cause problems for us and drop our CO2 too fast and you don't want to overshoot that. It's better to be a little bit on the hypercarbic side than it is to be below that 40 because it's a lot harder to get back. All right, air trapping and auto peep you got to watch for stacked breaths. We don't want to keep breathing for the patient if they haven't had time to expire. This increases the endothoracic pressure, as I mentioned before, and it could drop their blood pressure. you got to watch your SpO2 and make sure that you're not giving them breaths too fast. Your rate is going to probably be about 10, and make sure that IE ratio is increased a little bit. And make sure your patient has time to blow that air out. If your patient starts to desat, and the blood pressure starts to drop, you've probably got some problems. You're probably going to need to take that vent and take it off for a minute, let some of that air out, and then maybe ventilate them with a BVM. And then try to reset your settings to a slower rate, probably about, leave it at about 10, and probably change some things as far as your FiO2 and your PEEP. All right, so to summarize our obstructive strategy, we're going to consider the problem, and we're going to address the problem by giving them a tidal volume about 6 to 8 mils per kg. This is ideal body weight. Just because we get larger, our lungs don't. So we don't want to base our tidal volume on the patient's actual weight. So be careful not to do that. You may or may not need PEEP. You may just start out with zero PEEP or ZEEP and increase from there if you're having oxygenation problems. Watch those PEEP pressures. They may be higher than you expect them to need to be, but you may need to get a little bit higher just so you can get that ventilation and to be effective. You got to adjust the IE ratio to about 1.4 to 1.5 and make sure your rate probably stays around 10. You may have to increase that if they're really hypercarbic. You get those CO2s of about 70 or 80. You can probably set it at about a rate of 12, but I probably wouldn't go much above that. Most importantly, let them have time to exhale and make sure you listen to their lungs. 
as we consider this obstructive strategy, we were possibly, before they ever got into this situation, we may have been giving them beta agonists, the albuterol, the atrovent, and giving them the solumedrol. Don't stop doing these things just because you had to intubate the patient. Once you get them intubated, get your vent settings, you want to probably reinstitute this nebulizer in line so that we keep treating the patient and treating the underlying problem so that they can get better a little faster. All right, next I want to talk about the injured lung strategy, and this is the one that we use for everything else besides the obstructive strategy. This is all your unresponsive patients, your ROSC patients, unresponsive for whatever etiology. You can set the tidal volume to be about 8 mils per kg. Remember, this is ideal body weight. Don't increase the tidal volume just because the patient's weight is obese or they're just a little bit larger. Uh, make sure you base this off of their height. You can use a chart or whatever for that, and you can calculate it out. Just want to be on the safe side of this. Make sure we don't overventilate these lungs because, remember, a tidal volume equals lungs protection. Now, your rate can be set right at about 16. If you look, remember from the first uh, set of slides that we look at, um, when we consider uh, a minute volume of like 60 mils per kg per minute, and then we got to increase that, remember we had to increase the rate to meet those demands for eucapnia. So we want to watch the entitled CO2, set that rate, and then make sure that we don't overshoot by increasing the uh, ventilations to a point where we drop our CO2. If the CO2 starts to drop off, you might slow those respirations down to about 14, maybe 12. Now, when it comes to PEEP on the injured lung, you can start out physiologic. They're not auto-PEEPing. The, these lungs were probably not injured in the first place, potentially. They could be an ROSC patient, uh, could be unresponsive for whatever reason, and there wasn't really any lung injury, so you can probably start out with physiologic PEEP of 3 to 5. Now, should this be a pulmonary edema patient or a near drowning that is uh, starting to shunt some fluid, you may have to increase this PEEP a little bit. Just be mindful of the blood pressure. High PEEPs always cause a little bit of uh, blood pressure drop. You want to kind of balance this out and not go too high. You want to titrate the FiO2 like we talked about before. Do 100% to start off with. In about five minutes, you can gate this down because we're shooting for uh, SATs somewhere around 95 to 99%. Now, when it comes to intubated patients, we can't forget about sedation and pain control. Now, this is definitely needed for patients that are bucking the vent or over-breathing and causing a lot of alarms to go off, maybe some peak pressure alarms. Being intubated is not a comfortable situation for anyone. It is somewhat painful and probably needed a lot of sedation on board so that they will comply with the vent settings that we've got especially for obstructed patients, they need a chance to, to rest. And their, their problem was a disease of ventilation. They probably just got tired of trying to move so much air and not being able to expire. Sedation gives them a chance to relax, comply with the vent settings, and it'll keep them from hyperventilating should they try to overbreathe the vent. Keep in mind your protocols. You want to give them some Versed maybe 2.5 to 5 milligrams. You can repeat that up to a max of 10. Just be careful of their blood pressure. You may need to give a little bit of fluid with it. Always use those 250 boluses and then reassess. Fentanyl is a great drug for pain control. You can use a, mil per key, or a microgram per key, kg <clears throat> up to a max of 100 micrograms. You may repeat, but don't go past 250 micrograms or 3 micrograms per kg, whichever is less. You want to give them some pain control, but we don't want to overdo it. We're not worried about respiratory depression if we're ventilating them, but we don't want to give them so much pain control that they're completely snowed and are not going to wake up very soon. We want to be able to keep tabs on them so that we know where they're at. If they start to overbreathe, they're starting to wake up, we kind of want to know that. The ways that you know how much sedation you're going to need, watch their blood pressure. If it starts to spike, and the heart rate starting to go up, that probably means that your patient is waking up a little bit and probably needs a little bit more medication. All right, let's talk about non-invasive. This is a great strategy. We've been using CPAP for a long time. It's very effective at treating pulmonary edema. CHF patients, they do great with this. You give them some nitro, get them a non-invasive. You can usually get most people out of trouble in a hurry. If you apply these strategies, you can probably get most people out of trouble in 10 to 15 minutes. There are times where this non-invasive uh, approach is not effective because it's not instituted early enough. Maybe the patient waited too long to call us. In those cases, you're probably going to have to resort to BVM 
intubation, and setting them up on the vent on assist control and volume setting. To set up the non-invasive on this particular vent, you're going to need to do a couple of things. The default on the non-invasive setting is going to come up with a pressure support of 2 and a peep of 0. You're going to want to increase that peep to 10 by pushing the button next to the pressure or the PIP, the peak inspiratory pressure, and if you hold that button down for about 3 seconds, it'll pop up another window that shows you pressure support. Just turn that to 0. If we were going to do BiPAP or bi-level type respirations or assistance uh, for non-invasive, then we would probably use that pressure support at about 10 to 15 because that pressure support, remember, it adds on top of your PEEP and gives you an overall pressure. Since we're not doing bi-level assistance or non-invasive right now, right now you're just going to use a CPAP. So just turn that pressure support off, turn it to zero, and set your PEEP at 10. All right, here's a good picture right here to show you what the screen looks like whenever you're in uh, CPAP mode. You can see that uh, you got a low tidal volume on this. Your peak inspiratory pressure is about 15. What we want to do is hold the button right next to the peak inspiratory pressure right here. Hold it down, and that pressure support window will pop up in this area. You'll see it set at 2. Just turn your dial at the bottom and turn it back to 0 and hit OK. Next, you want to hit this button four times next to the peak inspiratory pressure, and it'll highlight your peep. You don't have to remember how many times to press it. Just press it until it's highlighted right here, and then turn it down or turn it up to 10, and then hit OK, and it'll save that setting for you. The settings on this vent don't change no matter what you do on that dial until you hit OK. So get it to 10, hit OK, turn your pressure support off, and you're ready to go. All right, let's talk about a couple of cases. So you arrive on the scene of a 27-year-old female with severe asthma attack. She's used her inhaler three times prior to your arrival, and she's not got any relief. She's alert and oriented, but she's got one-word sentences, so we obviously know she's in respiratory distress. She's becoming lethargic, so we're bordering on respiratory failure. Skin's cool, diaphoretic, and ashen. You also her lungs real short, inspiratory and expiratory wheezes. She doesn't sound like she's moving much air. So we look at our vital signs. She's sinus attack, obviously in distress. Hypertensive, another indicator. Her respiratory rate is 8, not effective. Obviously, her SATs are 60 and her CO2 is 55. She's in big trouble. So what are we going to try? Probably not invasive. Well, if she's an obvious respiratory failure, you could consider non-invasive if you think that she can breathe along with you. If you don't think she's going to keep putting out that effort to breathe and work with non-invasive, we're probably going to have to induce uh, with the Tomidate or said and get this patient ventilated more effectively and give her a break. She's probably going to tire out on you. So we may try ventilations with a BVM at first. You might be able to hook a uh, nebulizer to that, try a little bit of that, and see if she gets some uh, relief from that. If not, we're going to have to move to intubation. So once we get the patient intubated, continue with the nebulizer and albuterol and atrovent, and add your solumedrol uh, at the proper dose. So we put her on the ventilator after she's intubated. What are our settings going to be? She's going to go into the obstructive strategy. So we remember that we want to set our tidal volume based on about, we'll start about 6 uh, cc's per kg. And if she weighs about 60 kilos, that comes to about 360 mils. So we can start there. We still know that we can go to 8 cc's per kg if we need to. Okay, what mode are we going to use? Assist control, volume. So we set our volume, we set our rate, our FI2 is going to be 100. Do we need any PEEP? Probably not. So here's our settings. 360, rate of 12. Could try 10, but I'm going to try 12 on her. FIO2 of 100%, and we're going to start out with no PEEP. Let's see if this helps. Are we missing anything? You probably noticed that we're missing an IE ratio, and I've talked a lot about that. So let's go ahead and change that setting. We want to highlight the IE ratio by pushing the button out next towards the uh, breaths per minute. You're going to push it about four times, and it'll highlight IE ratio. Turn that knob until it changes 1.4 or 1.5, and then hit OK. Then we're going to watch this work a little bit and see how we're doing. This strategy should help increase the SVO2, should decrease her CO2, and make her more stable. So what else should we consider? 
we got to induce her with sedation, and so we probably want to give her a break and make sure that she's sedated, uh, and then maybe do some pain control potentially. We want to keep her comfortable and continue to ventilate her and continue to give our nebulized albuterol and atrovent. Don't forget to give your solumedrol. All right, case two. You're on scene with a 55-year-old cardiac arrest. The patient weighs about 75 kilograms, and after about 10 minutes of CPR and ACLS, your patient achieves ROSC. You got therapeutic hypothermia in place, and you get the following vital signs. As you see, you got a blood pressure of 150 over 76, which is great. You got a heart rate of 110. Your respiratory rate is assisted right now at a rate of about 10, and your SpO2 is 100%. You still got a CO2 of 60, which is a little on the high side. We need to set up the ventilator. Go ahead and transport. Consider the following settings. What strategy are we going to use first of all? We're going to use a lung injury strategy. This patient is not obstructed, but just an ROSC, so this setting should be fairly easy. Most of the default settings on our vent should work fine. We're going to choose volume mode. We're going to set that tidal volume based on that 75 kilograms, and then we're going to set our rate probably at about a rate of 16. We're going to try to get that CO2 to come down so the patient's not so acidotic. We can use about 3 to 5 on PEEP, and we've got to set our IE ratio. So here we go. We're using our lung injury strategy, and so we figure 8 mils per kg on our lung injury strategy. Our FiO2, we're going to stick with 100%, at least for the first little bit, and then we can bring that down to between 40 and 60 and try to titrate so that our SpO2 is between 95 and 99. So how do we correct the entitled CO2? That's an easy answer. We use the rate to do that. We set it at 16 and see if it starts to gradually bring, bring that down. If it's bringing it down, we probably don't want to change that much. So what do we want to set our PEEP settings? I want to start out physiologic and start at 3 and make sure I'm still getting good oxygenation. If I'm not getting good oxygenation and I'm still at 100%, I may want to increase that PEEP to maybe 5. Um, I'm probably not going to need to go up to 8. So if I increase the PEEP, how is that going to affect my cardiac output? Potentially, if it gets very high, it could decrease my cardiac output, and I don't want that, so I'm going to be very careful with it. So we're monitoring blood pressure, paying special attention to our CO2, making sure it's not coming down too quickly. I'm going to watch my SpO2. My target is 95 to 99. If I'm at 100, I just need to bring down my FiO2 to about 40 to 60 until I can get it in the range where I'm shooting for. Don't forget to listen to your lung on your patient because... That is the most important thing, is paying attention to your patient, listen to lung sounds, make sure they're bilaterally clear, we don't have any obstructions, and that make sure that both lungs are inflated. Watch their skin color, make sure they're good and pink, and make sure the patient's comfortable. You may have a patient that starts to buck the vent or overbreathe the vent. A little bit of this is okay. If they start to do it a lot and start to move around, consider sedation with Versed and fentanyl. Case three. You're called to a 34-year-old near drowning. The patient's not responsive, but has the following vital signs. You got a blood pressure of 104 over 60. You got a heart rate of 104. Your respiratory rate is 6 and shallow. Your patient is hypoxic at a SpO2 of 78, and your end title is high at 62. The patient weighs about 55 kilos. How are you going to set up the ventilator? What strategy do you plan to use? Is this patient obstructed, or are we going to consider lung injury strategy? So what mode, what tidal volume, rate, IE, got to consider all these different variables. So here we go. We need to use a lung injury strategy. The mode is going to be assist control volume. And so we went back to considering her weight at 55 kilos of ideal body weight and at 8 mils per kg. And that comes to about 440 mils. So we'll set our tidal volume at 440. We're going to set her rate at 16 because she's in the lung injury strategy. Our FiO2 to start off with, to get her oxygenated, we need to start with 1 or 100%. And we can put a PEEP at about 5. Considering she's a near drowning, should she got some lung uh, fluid and got some of the water in her lungs, we want to be on the leading edge of making sure that that fluid doesn't start to shunt into her uh, alveolar cavities there and start to infiltrate and cause some oxygenation problems. I don't want to remove the PEEP from this patient because it's probably going to help prevent some problems down the road. My IE ratio, 1 to 2.5 should work just fine. Let's watch our SpO2, shoot for that target, and we can change that if we need to. We probably won't. So after five minutes on the ventilator, we got the following vital signs. 
Her pressure is 110 over 62. Her SATs are 100 percent. Her antidotal CO2 is 32, a little low, and her heart rate is 100. What do I want to change on the vent to get to the target that I've got set for myself? I know my SpO2 target is 95 to 99. My CO2 should be about 40. So I probably need to change some things. Oh, let's go back. All right. So how do I want to change these vent settings? Well, if my SpO2 is 100%, I know I can drop my FiO2. I'm not going to change the P. I'll probably drop my FiO2 to 40 and watch my SAT very closely. If she starts to desat, I'm going to move it up to probably 50 or 60 and see if that fixes the problem. I will adjust the FiO2 based on her SATs. The end tidal CO2 is 32. I probably want to slow these respiratory rate down a little bit so that she can have a chance to retain a little bit of that because obviously we need some good cerebral blood flow. Low CO2s equal vasoconstriction and decreased cerebral perfusion. So I want to slow this rate down. I probably put her a rate of about 12 and leave her there and let that slowly come back up. I'll watch her heart rate and her blood pressure. If those start to climb, I may consider sedation and pain control. Case four, you have a 62-year-old male that is in acute exacerbation of COPD. He's got a history of hypertension, coronary artery disease, and he's a diabetic. Breast sounds are shallow with wheezes bilaterally. He weighs about 60 kgs and is thin. He's afebrile. His vitals are as follows. He's got a blood pressure of 144 over 92. His heart rate's 110. Respiratory rate is 28. He's got shallow respirations with wheezes. His CO2 is high at 58. His SATs are low at 88. So what are my treatment priorities? I want to get this guy some albuterol and atrovent. I want to get some solumedrol going on. Okay? He needs ventilatory assistance. It's obvious because he's hypoxic and hypercarbic. So I'm going to put a nebulizer on. I can use CPAP. See how he tolerates this. I recommend when you do CPAP is get the mode set up and get your, make sure you get your PEEP at 10. Turn off your pressure support and you should be ready to go. Get the mask and talk to the patient and coach them so that they know what's coming and that you can help them ad adapt to having this mask on their face blowing all this air. So you want to hold that mask up while you're talking to them and help keep them calm with a calm voice. Hold the mask to their face and keep a good seal. Coach them into taking the deepest breaths that they can and that way the medicine will be able to infiltrate to the alveoli and start to work. You want to monitor lung sounds, mental status, and ventilation effectiveness so that we know whether we need to continue this treatment or become more aggressive. So once with the patient's very tolerant of the mask, then we can strap it on their head and just continue to coach them while the mask is in place. So if the CPAP starts giving you an apnea alarm, what this means is that the patient's not ventil ventilating themselves well enough and they are bre breathing slower than 12 breaths a minute. If his mental status start is decreasing, we're obviously going to have to recheck things and look at his vital signs and consider another strategy. His pressure is 92 over 60. I got a heart rate of 130 and respiratory rate is 8 breaths a minute and shallow with little effort. Obviously, he's getting tired and giving up. His SATs are 85 percent. And total CO2 of 64, a lot higher than we would like it to be. So what options are you going to consider? Well, the patient's respiratory failure at this point and at risk for arrest. You want to consider automate or said and get the patient intubated so you can ventilate him effectively and continue to give him the medications that he needs. So you want to put him on the ventilator. What, what strategy are you going to choose? You're going to choose the obstructive strategy based on a COPD presentation. Okay, he weighs 60 kgs. You give automidate. Uh, do you need fluids at this point? Probably not right now, but we want to keep that on uh, the back burner for right now. So you get him intubated. What settings are you going to use? you got to consider you're doing an obstructive strategy, assist control, volume, and let's look at our settings. <clears throat> All right, we're going to start out with a tidal volume. I would probably start out with 6 uh, mils per kg on this guy, and that will give us about 360. If you wanted to go up to 8, that's good too. You just want to watch those peak pressures. Make sure they don't get too high. Um, set the rate at 10. Set the FiO2 at 100%. He was hypoxic, so we're going to try to fix that. Don't forget to increase the IE ratio to 1.4 to 1.5. You want to watch them really, really closely. Don't forget to listen to the lungs of your ventilated patients 
Listen to them often. If you have an intubated patient, your stethoscope should never be far away. Your vitals on your COPD patient now, his pressure has dropped to 88 over 48, and his heart rate is up to 140. We're assisting his respirations at 10, SATs are still low at 90, and his CO2 is still high at 60. So the peak pressure starts to alarm. Now, on these vents, whenever you get an alarm, a window is going to pop up, and it should ri uh, list for you all the possible causes of that alarm. At the very bottom of that window, you should see a suggestion from the vent of what you need to do. So what do we consider if our peak pressure starts to alarm? You listen to the lung sounds. You got a high peak pressure. You got to consider the pneumonic dope. Do we have a displaced tube? Do we have an obstruction? Do we have a pneumothorax or an equipment failure? If I listen to his lungs, I can probably tell right, right away whether I have a pneumothorax. Listen closely and compare both sides. As we talked about when we first started this scenario, this patient was thin and has COPD. He's at risk for a pneumo. If we still have CO2 and we still have ventilation, we know the displacement and obstruction are not the problem. If the vent's still going, we know that we don't have an equipment failure. So we're going to consider pneumothorax. You listen to both sides, and we got decreased lung sounds on one side. So what do you need to do? This patient's decompensating quickly, getting hypoxic and also hypotensive. A needle compression would be the optimal treatment for this patient. So do you need to change the vent settings? Are there any medications needed? You need to check his vitals. Okay, so as vent settings don't change, decompression would be successful and that would help us inflate that right lung. All right, so we recheck our vital signs. We've got a blood pressure now of 136 over 92. We've got a heart rate of 122. SpO2 is now 100%, so we, our treatment was successful. Our CO2 is 42, which is almost optimal for this kind of patient. Our GCS is 6, so we still got some moving around and got some eye opening. So you're going to treat this with some Versed and fentanyl, give your patient a little bit of a rest, make them more comfortable, and take away some of the discomfort that goes along with being intubated in the situation. All right, so I'm going to kind of summarize. For these modes and strategies that you're going to use, you have lung injury, you have an obstruction strategy, and then you have CPAP or non-invasive. Consider what strategy is needed for your patient at the time. Start out with a high FiO2 of 100% or and titrate down after about five minutes. And then you can just move it a little bit and increase it as you need to for hypoxic patients. You want to modify the rate to control the end tidal gradually. Make sure you don't change this rate drastically because you can overshoot and drop their CO2 very quickly. I would be very careful whenever I was adjusting rates. Start out with 16 for your lung injured patients. Start out with about 10 for your obstructed patients. Make sure you give those guys time to expire. Watch your peak pressures. We're shooting for 30 to 35. We don't want to go much over that. So if we go much over that, probably in an obstructed patient, make sure that it's still safe for your patient. Listen to lung sounds. Watch for chest rise. If you're getting good lung sounds and good chest rise, then you may need to back off your tidal volume a little bit. That's where you're going to see that. Don't forget to listen to the lungs. Just because they're ventilated and you've got uh, a monitor that monitors CO2 and SpO2 and all these great things, you've got to listen to your patients. So make sure you listen to their lungs. Make sure they got good bilateral breath sounds and you don't have any problems there. If they're still wheezing, continue to give them albuterol and atrovent through inline breathing treatments so that you can maximize your vent effectiveness and start making your patient better quicker. Last but not least, don't be afraid to use sedation and pain control. These things help your patient be more compliant with the vent. They prevent over-breathing or bucking the vent, and they help your patient get better faster if they're really tired from trying to deal with their CHF or COPD for a couple of days. They're probably going to be really tired. They can use that little bit of a break. So good luck to you guys. We'll see you in part three.